So Migraine Canada, who we are, we are a federally registered charity supporting the 4.5 million Canadians who live with headache or migraine and headache disorders. Um, our mission is to improve the lives of Canadians with migraine and other headache disorders through advocacy, awareness, education, research, and support. Um, before we start, we just want to point out that we do have the rest of our 2023 webinar series posted, so please check it out on our events page. Um, this includes on October 16th, our sleep and migraine webinar. Um, we would be thrilled if everyone continues to join our community. You can do that online at migrainecanada.org slash join. Uh, we also encourage you to check out our advocacy page where there's a lot of great advocacy tools. Um, and also check out our, our library, which are resources, um, short two pagers uh, for migraine management. And before we begin, um, something we say at the beginning of every webinar is that we are simply providing information, not medical advice. And we want you to note that this information presented and discussed might not apply to your own situation. Uh, always discuss medical treatments with your own healthcare provider who knows your medical history. Tonight, we are very happy that Wendy Gerhardt will be presenting. Wendy joined Migraine Canada as the Executive Director in January 2021. Her background includes 25 years in the pharmaceutical industry with experience in market access and stakeholder engagement. Over the past seven years, Wendy has been a consultant serving in leadership and project management roles with several organizations. She's a strong advocate for the highest patient outcomes, public and private medication access and care, and for shaping public policy, collaborating and championing change within our fast paced environment. Wendy is driven by her passion to improve care for Canadians afflicted by migraine. So um, really happy to be, be with everybody tonight. And um, thank you, Kaylee, for the kind introduction and uh, information about um, our events that are planned for the Q4 of 2023. Who knew we were already uh, fast paced into fall, but here we are. Um, so for the next 30 minutes or so, um, I'm going to be talking, as Kaylee alluded to, about um, the processes of how our pharmaceutical medications are approved and reimbursed in Canada under the public drug programs, um, uh, provincial drug programs. And then we can have time for a Q&A throughout. Um, I'll pause a little bit um, at each section, but then we can also just regroup at the end. So plop your plop your questions into Q and A. Um, we will not in this webinar be discussing how devices or supplements are approved because they go through a completely, I shouldn't say completely, but they go through a different process. Um, but uh, I we want to focus tonight on sort of how the pharmaceutical products are brought to market in Canada. Um, and we'll also not be really discussing private insurance, which we did a webinar last, I think it was last year, but um, we can also do another one coming up in 2024. But private insurance is a completely different beast in itself. So we're not going to really touch on that tonight either. So full transparency, guys, although I have a lot of experience and I, a lot of knowledge about reimbursement in Canada, the environment is very complex and there are many things that impact outcomes and timelines. So when we get to Q&A and throughout the, 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 the presentation, I'll do my best to answer your questions. If there's anything I'm not confident in answering, I'll follow up and make sure that you get the the accurate information that you're, you're asking for. Um, I also wanna just pause and just say like, what I'm presenting tonight is as current as what I'm aware of. Things are always changing and evolving. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a bit complex and um, timelines are always changing and that kind of thing. So with that, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Why can I not advance? Let me see, there we go. So tonight what I'm gonna cover is um, um, how to access medications in Canada for pharmaceutical uh, medications. Who are the stakeholders who are, are making decisions and 
um, making medications move through a process to get actually from research and development into our medicine cabinets. Um, what are the drug approvals? So what is Health, Health Canada's role? Um, what is the health technology assessment processes, which is CADIT and NES, which I know I use a lot of acronyms, the whole industry does. And I put a little legend at the bottom just to let everybody know exactly what CADIT is. And I'll go through that before we move on to the next slide. Um, what are the pricing negotiations that happen at the PCPA? And then what? where do we have um, opportunity to um, input the patient perspective? which um, is, is relatively new and it hasn't been around for forever, um, but it is definitely a welcomed input. It's new, it's relevant, it's time consuming. We call on you for, for input and that kind of thing. And, and not lastly, but how can you help? What, what, is, what is your role in your communities to kind of help to raise awareness and you know reach out and, and help to get products available where you live. And lastly, but not least, we'll, we'll, we'll loop back for a Q&A. So I just want to kind of, before I move on, so CADETH is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health Assessment. Um, INES is similar to CADETH, but it is very specific to only Quebec. And I'm not going to try to interpret the um, um, Annunciation of what it is, but it I, I I've spelt it out. But I, I I don't speak French, so I would just be doing a very huge injustice. Um, and lastly, um, PCPA is the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, and I'll go into more what their role is. But um, those are the acronyms, and um, I'm not sure. Maybe I should have probably just like cut and paste this into the chat so that everybody could fall back on it. But basically, Cadeth reviews health technology assessment, and in us the same, and then PCPA negotiates price on behalf of provinces. All right, I'm just going to pause very quickly because I know we only have an hour. So is there any questions at this point, very specific to like the acronyms or the um, institutions who review? So far, we haven't had any questions, Wendy. Perfect. So I'm going to move on. Two. All right. So how, how do we access medications in Canada? So there are virtually, I put down virtually three ways, but I added in patient support programs and I'll get to that. So there are really three formal ways to access medications in Canada. So there's through the public programs and there's through private insurance and there's through out of, po out of pocket. So when we refer to public access, this means where the provincial governments provide product through their formularies or drug benefit plans. Every province is a little bit different in how they name their plans, but it is, it's basically through like the provincial, um, the provincial plan. So approximately 20% of Canadians rely on public plans. Uh, approximately 60% have private insurance and 10% of Canadians pay out of pocket. And I, I, I use the word approximately because it also varies depending on the province that you're living in. Um, so that's something just to, to note. So in some provinces, there might be more people relying on the public plan and there might be less on, on in other provinces. So public plans, as I mentioned, are paid for and administered by the provincial and territorial governments. Most of these plans cover medications and vaccines for eligible groups, including seniors, recipients of social assistance, and individuals with conditions that are associated with high drug costs. Um, many of the drug, many of the public plans also have programs that cover costs of certain types of medications or to cover individuals with particular health conditions um, and or income thresholds. So, Private plans, or sorry, yeah, private insurance is covered, um, is coverage provided by an employer who offers benefits to their employees and dependents. So most large and medium-sized employers offer benefits of varying degrees. And so navigating the private 
pair world is equally or maybe more complicated than the pri than the public system. But uh, we're, we're really not going to dive into private insurance tonight. And the third and least ideal option is where Canadians have to pay out of pocket. This is the really unfortunate place to be in. Um, an example of where an individual might have to pay out of pocket is, for example, if your household income is too high or you've not met criteria for that province's listing. And I'm going to go into all this a little bit more, and I, I don't want to confuse people. So like I said, please feel free to kind of ask questions or wait maybe till I get to that section and then ask a question. Um, I did throw in um, patient support programs into this, this slide because it is an option to help with financial assistance. So patient support programs are in place. They are, they are um, owned and uh, like they're owned by the manufacturers of various um, medications. Um, and they're really brought into place to help with uh, reimbursement navigation and, and to bridge people from the time the prescription is written by the clinician to the time when the private insurance or the public insurance um, funding is or coverage is in place. So for I, I wanted to highlight this here because for people who choose to pay out of pocket, um, you may also be eligible for some type of financial assistance. And generally it's up to about 20%, which is what the copay is of private insurance. It, it's not going to cover the cost of your medication, but for some people, it gives you a little bit of financial assistance. And for other people, it will give you the opportunity to maybe try try a medication and see if it works and then and then um try to figure out paying for it on your own if you fall into that um out of pocket thing so again tonight we're just going to focus on discussing public insurance and the process that's involved to get our medication into your uh medicine cabinet okay so there are five stakeholders involved in uh, people accessing medications in Canada. So Health Canada is at the top of the uh, of the totem pole, if you will. It's the regulatory body that provides drug approvals for um, drug approvals in Canada based on safety, clarity, efficacy, and quality. Um, if a if a product goes through the Health Canada process and does not get um, an NOC, and I'll go into that it's not going to ever be available in Canada. So that is like sort of the starting place for any medication and device and supplement in Canada. Um, we then have the patent, patent uh, medicines price review board, which is uh, acronym of PMPRB. It is an independent body that sets the maximum allowable price of all potential of all patented medis medications in Canada. The price ceiling is, is set based on its assessment of the therapeutic value a product brings to Canada. And by doing a comparison of prices with the price, sorry, at the prices compared to other countries who are marketing um, uh, the product. Um, despite how important this is and the impact that it, it has on bringing new medications to Canada. I'm not gonna go into any detail about this. I'm happy to, I can't hold a webinar on something like this, but I can certainly have like an Instagram live event or a Facebook live event just to kind of go into explaining how prices are set in Canada. Um, so for CADETH, which is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, it conducts a health technology assessment as part of their common drug review. So you might often see the acronym CDR, which is common drug review. So it's a process um, that provides um, public listing recommendations. Health technology assessments are the evaluations of clinical, economic, and cost effectiveness, in addition to patient and clinician evidence. Uh, and I'll go, we, we have formal input into this process, and I'll go into that a bit more. Um, and I'll also refer to um, NS, as I talked about earlier, 
Um, it is very similar to Cadith, but it is very specific to Quebec. And last but not least is uh, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, so PCPA. It is the national body that is formed um, between the 10 provinces that negotiate the actual drug prices um, with the manufacturer uh, recommendations as a guide. Um, and then for the remainder of the webinar, again, I'm going to refer to the agencies using their acronyms. So uh, I apologize if I might lose anybody, but this is recorded, so you can go back. And then just lastly, again, um, private insurance companies, they control listings and reimbursement in the private sector. Approximately 60% of the population um, have private insurance. Um, and the majority of carriers have begun building internal health technology assessments and or managed listing, listing competencies based on what comes out of the Cadith and the NS um, reviews. And on to the next slide. Maybe, why is not advancing? Okay, so what does the drug approval process look like in Canada? Um, so manufacturers need to go through a lengthy research and development process that includes discovery, preclinical phase, and then three phases of cl clinical trials. Um, it sounds simple, but it's not a, it's a very compl a complicated process. From, from drug discovery to your medicine cabinet, it takes between 10 to 15 years and millions, um, even into the billions of dollars to into research and development, uh, depending on the, um, the innovative medicine. Uh, the entire process of completing all three phases of this, so that's research, uh, discovery, preclinical, clinical, and pharmaceutical uh, pharmacovigilance, um, um, anyways, it takes, it takes several years, takes lots of uh, researchers, patient volunteers who are participating in the um, clinical trials, scientists, doctors, researchers. Um, and at this point, there's really no guarantee of success. So there's a huge investment that the manufacturers are putting into this process. Um, when a clinical trial, for example, doesn't show promise, researchers go back to the drawing board or they abandon the, tr the, the trial altogether and the product will just never come to market. Um, again, we're not going to go into any more detail about um, clinical trials or that kind of thing. Uh, we can do a webinar specifically on that if the community is very interested. So drug approvals. Um, so once the clinical trials are completed, the first step is for the manufacturer to submit the file to Health Canada. Uh, this includes like information on all the data from the research and development of the medication. It's a, it's a very comprehensive package. Um, submissions are reviewed and assessed for safety, clarity, efficacy, and quality. Um, during the review, there's regulatory back and forth between Health Canada and the manufacturer. And then if the product meets all of the requirements from Health Canada, then a notice of compliance, so an NOC, or a notice of compliance with conditions and NOCC is issued. Once the NOC is awarded, the product can then be sold in Canada. So we like an NOC. All right, so now things get complicated if they weren't already. Um, so Canada's public reimbursement system, as I mentioned, is very complex and it's challenging. Um, the way things have evolved over the years, it's really added layers of access delays and, and that kind of thing. Um, so just as mentioned, the drug reimbursement system in Canada um, is, is complex. Um, it has 19 distinct public drug plans, including federal, provincial and territorial drug plans and over 40 private insurance carriers, each with their own drug formulary. So that's why I don't even want to get into the private sector tonight. That's a whole other conversation. The process outlined on the slide that I will walk you through takes approximately two to two and a half years from NOC. And we already learned 
how many years it takes to get through research and development. So, um, so from from NOC to get through the process, it takes um, approximately two to two and a half years, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. And we're seeing a little bit of, of, of both happening with uh, migraine medications. Um, for public reimbursement purposes, the first step are the reviews at CADIF and ANES. Uh, and so those are the two health technology assessment agencies in Canada, where the outcomes uh, slash recommendations from uh, Health Canada have significant impact. Both review how the drug submitted for, uh, for review compares to existing treatment options from both a clinical and cost effectiveness uh, perspective. Um, we then go on to the provinces, the provinces um, sort of, well, not sort of, but at the PCPA level, um, then review the decisions based on Cadeth and Ines, um, as to whether they decide to engage in negotiations with the manufacturer through the Pan-Canadian um, Pharmaceutical Alliance, which negotiates, as I mentioned, the terms and outlines the specific reimbursement conditions on behalf of the public payers slash provinces. Um, and then lastly, once the negotiations between the manufacturer and the PCPA office is completed, um, individual provinces then move on to decide whether to list the medications on their formularies um, or not. Um, at this point, I also want to mention, which is really important, is that it's not mandatory for all the manufacturers um, to, to actually go to um, CADETH or to um, uh, like PCPA. So um, for a few reasons, they might decide to just have their product reimbursed by um, private insurers. And that's kind of another conversation, but it, it, it's not mandatory. There's no, um, um, like you have to do this whole process. So there are manufacturers, I'll give you an example, is for Cambia and Suvex, that manufacturer chose due to very probably good valid reasons to not pursue the public reimbursement pathway. And so those products are really only available through the private insurance um, uh, channel. And then um, on the private payer side, once a product receives an NOC, um, the manufacturer starts the negotiations with each private insurer carrier who has its own formulary. And then they conduct its own review and decide its own reimbursement criteria. Um, and the process for that is typically not too bad. Um, it used to be rather immediate, but now it can take one to, between one to, to nine months for a product to be re reviewed and listed, depending on uh, the type of plans um, that that insurance company is offering. Um, so I'm going to pause here. Is there any questions that are coming in? Hi, Wendy. We do have a few questions. Um, okay. to, one question you made to backtrack a bit. Um, right. One person is asking if, how and if drug costs affect drug approval by Health Canada, Health and Welfare Canada. So Health Canada does not, um, there's a simply on, uh, on safety clinical, that price does not play a factor in that. And so that's why sometimes you'll see a product who receives an NOC from Health Canada that it just might not end up on your provincial drug plants because they're not reviewing it from a price um, perspective. They're just reviewing it from safety, clinical, all of the scientific um, perspectives. Okay, so then it's at the provincial level that they may decide not to approve it because of cost? Yes. Okay. Um, another question, it's specific to Diten. So I don't know if we want to answer this now or if it's better later on. Our ask, ask away and I'll see if I can answer it now or I might have to pull up something else to look at it. Yeah. Are Diten's 
ever going to be approved in Canada? If not, why, when they are considered more beneficial for seniors with migraine as they have less cardiovascular risk? So the answer to that, I do not know offhand. I would have to go back in my notes and we're just doing our quality of life or sorry, our, um, our report card launch. And I do have information specific to Ditan. So I'm probably going to put this on hold and I might just try and get back to this person or to the larger group um, specific to this with more accurate information. Like I said, I, I don't have everything front and center in, in front of me because there's just so many moving pieces, but I, I will get back to you on that. Okay, I'll make a note of it. Um, we also have a question. Can you explain what it means to add to formulary? In quotation, yeah. add to formulary. There. Yeah, so um, adding to formulary means um, when the provinces have gone through um, the PCPA negotiation process, and then, and I'll go into this in a few slides, but, um, and then they say, yes, and I'm just going to use Alberta as an example. I live in Ontario, so Alberta is a good province to use. Um, Alberta says, yes, we think this is a really good, relevant, um, and important medication to add to our portfolio of medications that we cover. They will, they will add it to their formulary, then meaning that doctors can prescribe and patients can be, re, uh, patients can be, um, put on product under the provincial program. So paid for by the government. I hope that kind of answers the question. And again, I'm always happy to answer emails or whatever, but uh, hopefully that kind of answers the question. Okay, the next question, and I think maybe a bunch of people have been thinking this, how did the COVID vaccines and new antivirals such as Paxlovid come to market and availability so quickly? Can this sped up process used for the COVID vaccines and antivirals be used from now on? I do not absolutely do not have an answer for that question, but that is a great question to get input in from our scientific advisory committee who are made up of healthcare professionals. I'm not a healthcare professional and I can't even begin to answer that, but I would be very interested in what they have to come up with. So let's, Kaylee, let's park that and um, bring this to the scientific uh, committee to, to weigh in on. Okay, and then one more question. Why are triptans not covered in Ontario? Ah, <laughs> great question. So we're actually just launching, I'm kind of doing my my, my presentation in, in different pieces, but we're actually just launching our, our, uh, our report card, which is basically a snapshot of what access looks like to medications and care in Canada. Um, so there's no clear answer to that. And, and when we launch the actual report card, you're going to see that um, there are there's not great coverage for triptans basically in any province, um, which is something we have to be working on because to get to these more advanced therapies, you have to have tried and failed on therapies. Um, and if they're not available through our public programs, it's kind of hard to get experience to try and fail on them. So um, I don't have an answer to your question. It's it's just adds to the work that we need to do to make triptans, which are in large part genericized. So they are virtually no cost to the to the province. Um so we have a lot of work to do to like make these all readily available so that people can try and fail and move on to the other medications. Um, hopefully that kind of answers your question. If not, email me and we can take it offline or we can do some posts to further explain this, but um, that's kind of the answer, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Wendy. That's all we have for now. Okay. Um, did I advance a slide or no? All right, so CADETH. So we've already talked about what CADETH stands for. Um, 
so what is the submission review process? So manufacturers submit to Cadeth and an S, um, typically mostly around the same timelines. Um, so, and they review based on health technology assessments. So that's the whole acronym HTA. Um, it's a review of the clinical and cost effectiveness analysis um, of the product. And, and each of these institutions, Cadeth and NS, they also, um, they solicit patient and clinician input. So this is where Migraine Canada and the Canadian Headache Society and Migraine Quebec all provide input into um, the submissions that, that's gone in on that specific product. Um, the manu it goes it, it goes through a bit of a back and forth and the manufacturer has a chance to respond to recommendations before it's made public. Um, groups like Migraine Canada and Canadian Headache Society and Migraine Quebec, we also have a chance to weigh in on recommendations that come out of that. At the end of the day, there it concludes with a recommendation based on criteria of whether to um, um, reimburse or not reimburse. All right, and then once the Cadeth recommendations are made public, and I told you everybody, this is a long process. It's lengthy, it's very complicated. Um, once the Cadeth recommendations are made public, um, the file then goes into a queue at the PCPA, so the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. Um, and remember that the pan that the PCPA, um, based on the Cadeth criteria, negotiates price with the manufacturers. And I'm slowing right down because I know I talk very fast, but I want you to understand that. So the PCPA negotiations are based on the Cadeth criteria, and they negotiate price with the manufacturers. Until the negotiations commence, the file is kind of, like I said, it's in a queue and it's considered under, under consideration. When the provinces are ready to pick up the file and start negotiations, an engagement letter is then issued to the manufacturer and the negotiations commence. Once the pro one province will actually take the lead in the negotiations, and it could be, could be Nova Scotia, it could be BC, it could be Alberta, it, it could be um, any any province um and they they lead though they lead, they lead those negotiations on behalf of the provinces all having conversations with the various provinces obviously because they are weighing in on the price that they're willing to pay so um at this point i just want to mention that like that not all provinces need to opt in to negotiations. So provinces can choose to opt out or choose to opt in. When a province opts out, it generally means that the province has no intention of listing and it will not negotiate separately with the manufacturer. This is like a bad news story for our community. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it it has happened. So, um, and the other thing just to note is that the manufacturer or, or public do not really know which provinces are at the table during these negotiations. Um, some considerations. So when I, I think probably a question that is brewing through people's minds is, so what are the considerations as to um, when like negotiations will start or how fast they'll start or, or even why they'll start. So some of the, some of the, um, considerations given is, um, the Cadeth or the NS recommendations. Um, is there, is there therapeutic gaps in care? What is the budget impact analysis? So we call it a BIA. What is the budget impact analysis on what it, what this product is actually going to cost um, a province. Um, the therapeutic landscape, the current coverage of alternative drugs. And so in, in migraine, we know that a lot of the older medications, which is, are what we've only had exposure to, are, you know, they, they weren't even designed to treat migraine. So, um, you know, we have a, we have a fresh kind of 
offering of medications that have been designed to treat um, migraine. So, you know, th there should be no issues with that. Um, and, and, and that's about it. And so when negotiations are successful, so after give and take through the manufacturer, and, and I'm not at the table, nor any patient organization in any of these, it's all confidential. Um, so when ne negotiations are success successful, a letter of intent, so we call it an LOI, is awarded. And when negotiations conclude without a letter of intent, the next step is is really um, that that negotiations are not going to proceed within the provinces. Like there's not going to be listings um, in most cases. That's not to say in all cases, but in most cases. Um, and it's important to note that. Um, once negotiations are concluded, and even if a province opted in, it doesn't automatically mean that the province is going to actually list. So at, at the end of the day, a province might just go, no, we're not going to do this. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of all I had to say about this. So is there, I'm going to go stop and pause. Is there any questions about the pricing negotiations or the process that's involved with this? Um, we do have a few questions about different treatments. Um, the only one related to pricing uh, is, do the price of new drugs eventually come down? For example, my first Ajovi dose was quoted at about $629. Um, so without talking with this person um, kind of privately, um, I would have to learn more about where they got their quote from, but like kind of generically speaking, the prices will not come down like they've the manufacturers have negotiated pretty low um based on like pmprb pricing and then bulk pricing which is what the pcpa negotiations are about so there, there's not going to be a lot of lower like like they don't discount their medications they're they're pretty you're getting that price is probably the lowest that it, it will it will go um, until and maybe we'll get a little bit into this if we have time but like like brand name innovative pharmaceutical companies who bring these new medications to market um, they have a patent so when the patent runs out then the generic manufacturers will start to manufacture at a significantly reduced price, which yes, will bring down the price of the medication uh, longer term. But we're we're pretty we're pretty new in the life cycle of the medication, so it's going to be several years before we see generics kind of step in and um, bring down the price of these newer innovative medications. I I, I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Oh boy, we have a lot of slides to get through. Okay, so the point, the patient voice, the patient voice, the patient voice. Um, so we already talked kind of about all of the people, the stakeholders involved to get the product through the pipeline. So where we have formal patient input, so where I actively seek your input to design submissions and that kind of thing, are at Cadith and S. I partner with Migraine Quebec. And also BC has their separate formal process. Other than that, everything else is very informal and I'm advocating on a regular basis with outreach to the provinces and through PCPA to talk about why we need new medications. You know, we don't have a lot of options for migraine care um, and that kind of thing. And so just to highlight again, you know, from Health Canada to where we see negotiations and with the P, uh, PCPA 
is ab about 2.5 years. So we've already seen the time it takes to get through research and development, and now we're seeing another 2.5 years. So just emphasizing how long it takes to actually get a medication into where you can like purchase it or be prescribed it or that kind of thing. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I had built in all these. So yeah, I'm just going to go through all these. Okay, so just recapping kind of on where we are today, there's been four revolutions of migraine care in Canada. So in the 1990s, we had the trip downs come. Um, in 2011, we had Botox come. CGRPs came to market starting in 2018, and now we're recognizing in 2022 the GPAN. So we've had a lot of new medications, but we had a good gap in where there was no new medications coming to care. Um, so I just want to give you kind of a snapshot of what that looked like. So what does our current environment look like, guys? So uh, this is the world that I really live in. Like I'm up to my, I would say, far beyond my knees, maybe up to my elbows in. But um, here's the current environment. So if you look across um, the table that I have, um, here's the medications that have gone through CATA. So we have Botox, Ajovi, Amavig, Engality, Viepti, and Quilipta. Um, Nirtec is on the horizon, Ubralvi, um, I'm not completely sure where Abvi is going with submitting to CADET, but I think it's going to happen. Um, so we, we, we have a nice uh, flashlight of green happening here. When we look at the PCB, PCPA negotiations, Botox got a red X, Ajovi, green, Amavig, red X, Emgality, Viapti, green, and then Quilepta is actually just being negotiated as we speak. And Nurtec, of course, is um, to be determined because they have not received NOC yet. Um, so what I do want to highlight just to bring to everybody's consideration is um, even though Botox got uh, X at PCPA negotiations, they do, there is like general coverage open means like, there's no criteria to be met in Alberta. Ontario has criteria and Quebec has criteria. Um, so at least those are options for people who live in those provinces. The rest of the provinces, there's no coverage. There's it's not, it's not an option. Um, Ejovi is listed now in all provinces. It has decent criteria. And it also um, we're working on trying to improve subsequent um, approval timelines. Um, so we're moving, we're trying to move those from six months after the first approval to 12 months, just meaning we're working on it requiring basically less paperwork for your healthcare professional um, from six months to one year. Amovic is not a, a not a question, not a conversation. And Gality is now listed in all the provinces. Um, and Viapti, who just received their NO, or sorry, their um, their PCPA um, letter of intent. Uh, I think it was in June. I have it on the next slide. Um, we were recognizing coverage in Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. Now we do know um, for Viapti that BC is a troubling province in that they opted out of the negotiations. So I'm doing a lot of work um, independently of Lundbeck to, um, um, to have conversations with the provinces and, you know, talk about the need for medications and, and all of that kind of thing. But uh, that is a red flag on my to-do list. Uh, and again, Quilipta, we're just waiting and seeing, Nurtec and you briefly. So that's the lay of the land there. And I just wanted to kind of highlight the, some of the timelines because I think it's important people recognize how long it takes to actually move um, a product review through the processes. So, you know, I'm not going to go over this in detail because I'm just being really cognizant of the time, um, but it, 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 it takes months. Um, and in some case, cases, like a lot of months. 
Um, and then in some cases, you know, the manufacturer and me invest a lot of time in, in conversations and that kind of thing to end up without an LOI. So um, the one thing I did want to highlight is that to date, that PCPA has been in existence, and that's several years now. They've completed 642 negotiations, and 550 of those have concluded with a letter of intent, and only 92 have concluded without an LOI. So when I do my math, and I, I have a, a student, um, a university student helping us out who's working on this, like I read it as 86% 80, ended in an LOI compared to recent migraine treatments where only 60% added ended in an LOI. So I, I find that a, like there's a lot of inequities and um, I think it speaks to the amount of work that we need to do to make migraine really a conversation piece and respected and, and relevant into the conversations of why we need new medications. I'm going to pause there and just ask if there's any questions. Hi, Wendy. Yes, we do have some. Just quickly, uh, someone asked that you broadly categories blank. Sorry, I must have missed why no approval. Yeah, so Ubrelvi is approved in Canada, like it has an NOC, but the manufacturer has chosen, um, and I can't get into the specifics of why, but there's just a pause on whether, and I think they will eventually um, submit to Cadith, but um, there's just a pause on actually submitting to Cadith but it is available for sale in, in, in Canada. So if you have private insurance, you may have access to it, but just not, again, we're talking about public right now. So just not through the public system. So okay. happy to, if this person wants to email me for more information, we can chat offline, but that's the nuts and bolts of, of that. Okay, and um, will migraine modulation devices ever be readily available in Canada at a pharmacy or from a doctor, such as Cephaly or GammaCore? Yeah, so really good question. Um, so, I mean, I have so many things to advocate for. Like, that's part of what our report card will show and demonstrate is that yeah, like devices should be a part of a treatment regimen, but I'm going to answer your question. So no, they're, they're, they are not reviewed at the moment by Cadeth and S and therefore not through the public drug plans. It is my goal that we do have these treatments because they are a treatment and they're effective um, longer term to go through this process but they do have their own separate um, mechanism of being approved through health canada so that they can be distributed in health canada but there's yeah there's no and and there's no private insurers that to my knowledge that cover devices and i I totally think that they should because um, there's lots of people who need a little add-on to a pharmaceutical or they don't want to take a pharmaceutical and this is effective for them. And there's lots of pediatrics who like, let's face it, parents don't want to pump meds into their kids. So they would like to try a, a device versus, mm -hmm. um, and I hope that my pharmaceutical friends do don't don't sue me for that for that comment but the reality is i think those two devices need need to have a, a playing field in the canadian market to supplement or to you know for people who are just like treatment naive and they just don't respond to the pharma pharmacologics i think the the devices are a good option and for those that it works they should have access to them what about um, supplements like B2, magnesium, COQ10? They are recommended by neurologists for migraine. Um, 
they're non-prescription and they can't be submitted in income tax filing, does Migraine Canada lobby for coverage? We talk about it. I, 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 to be fully transparent right now is just trying to get these new medications that are available, like recognized, acknowledged, listed, um, longer term. And it's not that it's not something that we talk about. And I, I don't have a slide on it of the importance of the, um, the supplements. Um, they again, go through a different process. Um, trying to get those included into a formulary is really uncharted waters for me, but it's definitely not something I'm not going to go down because I know that lots of doctors prescribe the supplements either in conjunction with, in, co in combination with, or even on their own, because some people just don't want to take pharma pharmacologic medications. And so, and so for some people having just taking some of these supplements, it works for them. So again, I'm all about access to all of these treatment options and who is really anybody making decisions to decide what is what what is reimbursed what is not and i think they should all be so that's kind of where i come from is every medication or supplement or device that a doctor and a patient are talking about those should be available um i hope that answered kind of your question i i'm not sure if it did or not but we have we have a lot more questions coming in wendy okay um i think this may resonate with a lot of people i am currently taking culipta and has been helpful for me the only thing that has been so far for prevention however i'm paying out of pocket for the medication and my work benefits don't cover unfortunately out of pocket for me is a quarter of what i make in a year and it's not sustainable for me long term with our current economic circumstances. Are there other options to get this medication covered publicly or even some partial financial support in the public sector? I find it confusing why a medication wouldn't be covered when the cost of individuals having to stop working and apply for ODSP would be much greater costs if we cannot function or work due to not having access of needed medication. Yeah, that's a great question. So as 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 I have noted on the slide here, it does have a positive recommendation through CADIF. Um, it is under negotiation through PCPA. Um, sorry, is does this person have private insurance? I don't Taylor? believe so. Okay, so relying on the public system. So my work benefits don't cover the medication. Okay, so the person has private insurance. So um, dependent on where you're living and who your employer or your spouse's or partner's employer has coverage through, it may just be that migraine medications are not covered on that particular plan and i'm going to get into a little bit about private insurance in a few slides um and i, I should probably just do a, a completely separate webinar on advocacy but um kind of park that question so the long answer short is for public reimbursement it's going through um pcpa so there is no current um reimbursement publicly i do know quilipta has decent coverage through private drug plans so what that means is that the manufacturer has done a checkbox saying canada life or sun life or manu life is covering our product what that does not mean is that it's translating down into your employer saying I want to include migraine medications in the benefit package I'm offering John or Joe. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm like, it's so complicated. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know how to make it simple because it's not. So that might be where you're getting caught up and maybe you can email me offline and we can kind of talk this through a little bit more. Thank you, Wendy. 
Um, the next question is, to what extent is transparency a factor in the price negotiation process, given that the same medication can be cheaper in Canada than the US and more expensive than in New Zealand or Australia? Yeah, so that comes down to um, the pricing, the PMPRB pricing guidelines, who uh, PMPRB sets the price um, with with the with input from the manufacturer of what it can be sold for in Canada. And so sometimes, and thankfully not too often, if a price, so I'm going to compare it to the states. So if a if a, if a product is being sold to the states at a certain price, and Canada is not willing to sell at that price, sometimes the manufacturer will just choose not to bring the product to Canada, mm -hmm. and that's the reality that we're living in, and it's not a good reality. So, to the question of the transparency of the pricing it is is we can see what it's pretty transparent what the price is in certain provinces, but that's not the actual price because when you go to your, um, when you go to your pharmacy, they, they add on their pharmacy prices and that kind of thing. That's why we we've done away with listing prices on our website is because it can fluctuate. If you go to Costco and again, I'm going to pick on Alberta. I don't know why I'm from Alberta. I live in Ontario, but I'm from Alberta. So if you go to Alberta and you go to Costco, they might give you a price of, I don't know, $600 for a Jovi. I'm, I'm totally making this up. And then you go to Safeways and they're going to give you a price of 520. Why is there a difference? It's because of their pharmacy markup. Um, that's something we don't have control over. Um, well, nobody has control over. It's up to the pharmacy network. Um, but by and large, the prices that the provinces are listing, I might have to check this. I think they're fairly trans. No, I, I think they're not transparent. Um, and that's why you see the fluctuations in price at the pharmacy, because you don't know what that markup is. I might follow up with um, just some concrete information on that. So I am not leading anybody down the wrong road there. Thank you, Wendy. You're doing um, all these follow-ups, right, Kaylee? I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question. I'm thankful I don't have 15 or more migraines per month. However, this disqualifies me from many medications. I do have five to eight, which still negatively impacts my life. I've tried many medications, both preventative and acute care, that have not been effective for me. Are there other options? That's... Uh your question is is great and i think um before i could even offer any advice and i can't offer medical advice i'm not a clinician um i would have to have like a one on one conversation with you and kind of direct you maybe how to have that conversation with your clinician um that's probably the best way i can answer that question all right i'll get them our contact information and yeah. just Quickly, Wendy, if you could go through and label each of these medication options as either daily preventive or rescue medication so that people can get an idea of what they are. Okay, go to our website and go on to our um, PDF library and we have um, the G-Pants um, PDF that Dr. LaRue just did and that will give you actually all of the accurate information. I should have printed those out and had them like at my fingertips, but go to the website, www.migrainecanada.org. And Dr. LaRue has revised and just done the G pants um, PDFs that will have preventative and acute. And that will, will help you out and you can print it off and have it as a Bible. Great. Thank you, Wendy. That's it for now. Okay. And I know we're over time, but I think I only have a few more slides. So in summary, guys, like why do we need new medications and devices to treat migraines? So first of all, first in class medications designed, so actually developed to treat migraine based on scientific knowledge. 
a lot of the medications that have been prescribed to you in the past have been like for epilepsy or for seizures or for depression. So they weren't designed. They just, they weren't designed to treat migraine. They just, they just worked. But now we have these medications who were actually researched and developed to treat migraine. So that should be like a no brainer for anybody making these decisions. Um, the, the, the current options or the, I should say not the current, but the past options are just not sufficient. They're like, um, there, there's lack of effectiveness. The side effects are horrible. Um, they're just, they're old. They're just not designed to treat migraine. Um, and, and just adding on to that, the newer generation medications, they have pharmacological advent, uh, advantages. Again, they're designed to treat migraine. So they, they have been researched, researched and studied. Um, and, and lastly, like migraine is disabling and very costly to the healthcare system, to the individual, to its network, to society at large. And so I don't know, like I, I preach to the choir, um, or I guess I don't preach at the choir because everything that we have to offer about these new medications is, um, there's a no brainer why they should be offered. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just really cognizant of time guys. Um, so like what is Migraine Canada doing and what is our messaging? So who do we meet with? I meet with the ministers of health. I have ongoing co communications and meetings with the various government ministries, um, deputy ministers, um, and the drug plans, and then extending outreach to um, other ministries. So finance, women's issues, um, ministers of employment, um, all talking about migraine and the impact in to each respective ministries. Um, and, and what is our messaging? So our messaging is education on migraine to eliminate stigma. Stigma. We need to narrow the knowledge gap and, and that migraine is just is more than just a headache, ache, bleh, more than just a headache. Um, migraine is costly to society. There's a significant burden on quality of life. We have um, our report um, completed from the quality of life survey now. And we also have our report card coming imminently and within days. Um we need access to effective, tolerable, safe medications. There's a need for choice. Um, physicians and clinicians need options. They need more than one or two options. They need options to everything that Health Canada has approved. Um, and, and really just emphasizing that what many people are still using are old and, and they're, they're not effective and they have really nasty side effects. Um, and we need we need access to improved care, and we need access to healthcare professionals to actually treat migraine. So that's a little bit about what we're doing and what our messaging is. Um, and I'm getting to the end here. So leveraging our resources, um, we have recently launched our Canadian um, language guide, which is really. Um, the objective of that was really to get people all kind of talking the same language and, you know, um, what we hear from a lot of people, and this is internationally, uh, people living with migraine don't want to be referred to as a sufferer, but to somebody who lives with migraine attacks. So we're trying to adopt um, certain language practices that hopefully will unfold across the various um, um professions and, and stakeholders who are having the conversation about migraine. Um, we recently launched our quality of life survey report, which is um, called the uh, burden of migraine. It's posted on our website. Um, lots of great data. Thank you to everybody who participated in the study. We had 1165 people participate, 1144 from Canada. Um, really good, strong data. So thank you for everybody who participated. And I strongly en encourage you to go and take a look on the website. I should have put the links up here. Um, we also uh, developed uh, a series of infographics on the various topics on uh, from that survey so thank you thank you thank you thank you um and the report card so we're just getting ready to launch the report card and really what that is is it's going to give a snapshot to our 
government as to what access to care and treatment looks like for migraine in Canada. And it really gives um, a, a, a very clear screenshot of where the gaps are. And with that comes recommendations that we will be working towards long term to uh, and measurable that we can measure as we make progress um, as to where the gaps are and, and what we're trying to get towards to make migraine care in Canada be a priority and also um, support the community. So um, watch for that, guys. That's going to be coming out very soon. Um, and then also just leveraging Canadian voices. So um, we really are looking forward to recruiting ambassadors in each province to sort of be our voice there. Like I, I like I said, I, I have meetings in every province with various stakeholders. I would love to bring somebody to every one of those meetings with me that lives in that province, because you're the people who elected these guys in. And so your voice is bigger than mine when you talk about it. So if you're interested in, and being a part of that will provide training and support and that kind of thing leading up to meetings. I, I want you by my side because I can talk on your behalf, but man, when they hear from you who voted them in or maybe voted them out, I don't know. But when they hear from you living in said province, that, that it's huge. So uh, just kind of talking about the resources, I probably left a few things out. I don't have time. I, I wanted to dive a little bit into a little bit of self-advocacy, but we don't have time tonight. And maybe what I'll do with Kaylee is talk a little bit about uh, about the opportunity this fall to hold um, a follow-up webinar where we talk about self-advocacy and what you can do, how to do it, because that it really is in itself um, a webinar on its own. And so I'm just going to kind of pop through these. Um, and this is going to be, I'll, I, I can actually go through and record what I was going to say tonight on the actual recording of the webinar. Um, but like, so just, I'm just going to take two seconds. So if your claim is rejected um, by either provincial or a private, um, there's lots of things you can do. Don't give up. I'm telling you, don't give up. First of all, make sure that your, your, your rights under the policy are in place. Make sure that you have not made a claim that is something for which you're not entitled to. For example, have you met the criteria? If you've not, don't even apply for, um, don't even apply for reimbursement. Make sure that you get through that in criteria and your doctor will help you to do that. Um, if you think you're entitled, don't let the first or even the second rejection stop you. Persistence is key. Um, um, use, use the appeals process that is in place in your province or with your insurer and ensure that your physician is on board with you. Obviously, if your physician has prescribed you the medication or your clinician, um, they're, they're going to kind of have your back and want you to get it. So just make sure that all of the, the, the necessary documentation is completely filled out. You've met all of the criteria. You've checked every box, double check, that kind of thing. Because sometimes it's just insufficient information that is causing the rejection. Um, and, and sometimes doctors make an error in the paperwork. So they're human. They have a lot on, on the go and they, they do a lot of paperwork. So it could just be that there was sort of um, that error. And if it's your employer who has excluded the drug, again, I want to do a whole webinar on this, but, um, you know, there's a number of things that you can do. You can talk to your employer. Um talk about the, 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 the impact that the medication has on the disease management. Um, um, ask your health benefits manager. It's often your HR manager, why they decided not to cover the drug or discover or, or to cover drugs for migraine. And again, it kind of feeds back into lack of awareness of the impact of migraine in the workplace. Um, and, and yeah, so just kind of don't give up, reach out to me. I can kind of help you along the way. Um, and so 
yeah, we're like way over. So what can you do? Share your voice. Um, we do have a seamless advocacy template on our on our website where you just can go pick a, from a, a number of different template letters um, related to what your situation might be like. Fire information off to your, all you do is type in your postal code, your minister of health, your deputy minister of health, and your local elected official will pop up. You just tailor the, the template letter a little bit and you hit send and off it goes. Um, I, I am always advocating for you and I, 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 I'm, I'm making progress. I think I have, and I'm gaining attention, but man, you guys are the best people to share your voice and the more letters. And even if you sat down once a week and fired a letter off to your elected local official, that person's going to respond to you and probably going to want to have a meeting with you. So you guys, like you guys are so powerful. You don't believe how much power you have. I encourage you to just take the time and email your, your government about why we need access to these new medications. Cause there hasn't been any, um, and what else can you do? So if you're not a member of Migraine, and we don't have members, but if you're not a part of our community, join us. This is how you do it. MigraineCanada.org, join. Um, and again, share your voice through our advocacy platform. Um, the only thing you're going to do is help. And with that, is there any last questions, Kaylee? I know it's like really late. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just a couple. Um, would you have a guess as to why a Jovi, Amgality, and Amovig would be covered by private insurance, but not the by FD? Is it because it's newer to Canada? Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you have to remember that by FD has just was sort of the last CGRP to enter the market, so um, they're gaining lots of traction. Um, the other thing I don't think I know I mentioned, guys, is that to be really important to um, have on your radar is in the provinces of, and I had it written down um, in provinces where the, the, the major drug, the, the major private insurers mimic the, um, the public drug plans. So that's like BC, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, they will not list a product until the province has listed. So where we talk a little bit about BC, we need you guys to be like really pumping your minister of health because that is the public reimbursement is flowing into BC Pharmacare. So um, you'll hear lots more from me on this because it's a huge issue and BC is a huge population. Um, and uh, like, it just creates complete inequity of access, um, to care. Thank you. Wendy. And finally, just a suggestion here. I think this person was quoting what you had said earlier, um, quoting need for access to effective, tolerable and safe medications. We want to add affordable to this messaging as well. So that it's effective, tolerable, affordable, and safe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with any new innovative medications, there comes a price, right? Like, um, and I and I take my pharmaceutical hat off because that's where I came from for a long time. But it costs a lot of money to bring these medications to market, and so um, I can assure you, from what I know, the manu the manufacturers have really done a good job negotiating price. Like, if I compare um the cost of migraine medications which is you know several hundred dollars say 500 600 dollars a month to um medications to treat arthritis which are like thousands of dollars a month this is a no-brainer and i think it falls back to this is me personally speaking is there a little bit of stigma like, oh, like why do we have to pay so much for my, like for headache treatment, um, which leads into the importance of all of the advocacy and the education that we're doing to say like, 
but these the, the this little few hundred dollars is putting people back in the workplace you know um and again i go back to bc um i have handfuls of nurses who are on disability and or have left the workforce for early retirement because of their migraines and we're in a healthcare professional shortage like we're short nurses but these people would love nothing more than to be working and so this makes no difference like so like, this is a non-brainer to me cover the medications get these people back working helping out the healthcare system and it's not just that it's teachers it's like it it just um it's not like any profession specific it can be filtered over into lots of professions i'm sure there's lots of police officers who are on disability because they you know their migraines are impacting their life and they don't have access um i i think i'm going off on a rant but um yeah like it, the 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 price for these medications for the payer is not significant compared to other treatment options. And Dr. LaRue would say like, you know, if you compare it to a treatment option for MS or epilepsy, which is like $50,000 a year for one treatment, like we're talking $500, $600. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you, Wendy, for all of that information. You crammed in as much as you could. Thank you. I hope I didn't overshare. <laughs> and just a reminder, everyone, if we didn't fully answer your question, if you have more questions, contact us at info at migrainecanada.org. And Wendy has provided her personal email address as well, executive director at migrainecanada.org. Uh, check out our events page for the rest of our fall webinar series. Follow us on our social, join our community and healthcare professionals. You can request a participation certificate. And with that, uh, have a great evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us.